the uh, you know I was mentioning using religion. This is one of the things that autocrats and authoritarians use is is religion. And uh, there's this new project. Uh, it's called Project Blitz. This new this new organization that is like the uh, Catherine Stewart wrote about it in the New York Times this weekend. And uh, it's it's like a a Christian version of Alec, you know, the Amer American Legislative Exchange Council, where uh, you know, funded by the Koch brothers and others, that gets together lobbyists and legislators, state legislators, a couple times a year, and they and the lobbyists write legislation for their particular industries that they would like, and they give it to the legislators, and the letters, legislators take it back to their particular state legislature and introduce it. Well, this is the same thing only for Christians, and uh, they've already uh, introduced over 70 pieces of state legislation based on uh, what so-called Christians want. Uh, the one in uh, Oklahoma, for example, allows uh, agencies that uh, participate in, in um, adoptions to discriminate in those adoptions based on race, gender, sex, religion, whatever you want. Um, in Minnesota, it's letting schools post in God we trust signs in their classrooms, something the Supreme Court has already said you can't do. Um, 1786, Thomas Jefferson was living in France. He was our envoy to France. Madison had just put together the Constitution. Jefferson had demanded that there be a Bill of Rights attached to it and in fact wrote the First Amendment. And uh, then he sent, on August 13th of that year of 1786, he wrote this long letter to Judge uh, George Wythe, who was a, uh, a Virginia judge. And uh, he had been uh, one of Jefferson's teachers when he was a teenager, George Wythe had, you know, literally taught him law. He was a mentor and a teacher. And so uh, Jefferson writes him this letter and says, our act for freedom of religion is extreme. Now, keep in mind, this, you know, David Barton is one of the guys behind this, this, uh, this new project Blitz, which uh, he said, he told, you know, he said, uh, uh, quote, it's kind of like whack-a-mole for the other side. It'll drive them crazy that they'll have to divide their resources out in opposing this. In other words, they're going to throw so much legislation in so many state legislatures that something's going to slip through, right? So this is what Jefferson thought about people like David Barton and the, Repu the modern-day Republican Party. He's in France. Uh, the word in all the newspapers is about the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. And he says, our act for freedom of religion is extremely applauded. The ambassadors and ministers of the several nations of Europe resident at this court have asked of me copies of it to send to their sovereigns. And it is inserted at full length in several books now in the press, among others, the new French Encyclopedia. I think it will produce considerable good, even in these countries where ignorance, superstition, poverty, and oppression of body and mind in every form are so firmly settled on the mass of the people that the redemption from them can never be hoped. If anyone thinks that kings, nobles, or priests are good conservators of the public happiness, send him here. It is the best school in the universe to cure him of that folly. He will see here with his own eyes that these descriptions of men are an abandoned confederacy against the happiness of the mass of the people. Jefferson went on to say that uh, the people of France have been loaded with misery by nobles and priests and by them alone. He continues in, the article, in, the, in his letter to George Wythe and then references Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which gives Congress the power to raise money by imposing taxes and use that money to provide for the general welfare of the people. And he says, Preach, my dear sir, a crusade against ignorance. Establish and improve the law for common, educating the common people. Here's Jefferson calling for fully pu paid public education. He's got to be looking at Betsy DeVos right now and rolling over in his grave. He said, let our countrymen know that the people alone can protect us against these evils and that the tax which will be paid for this purpose is not more than the thousandth part of what will be paid to kings, priests, and nobles who will rise up among us if we leave the people in ignorance. But it needs but half an eye to see when among them that the foundation is laid in their dispositions for the establishment of a despotism. He's talking about religion in France. Okay, next one. Co-opt and make institutions of military and police power into loyal syncopants. This is like creating your own Praetorian Guard from attacking the NFL players who are protesting police violence against unarmed black people to telling a crowd of police officers not to be professional or arrest people when, uh, when they're arresting them, to chest-thumping about our military as the most powerful ever, 
Trump doesn't even try to be subtle about these threats. The next step, if he follows this well-worn authoritarian path, will be to put on Saddam Hussein-style military parades in Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, as all this is going on, the problem, process that Ronald Reagan began and Newt Gingrich sped up in 1996 with his 1033 program of redirecting billions of dollars of military funds, hardware, and training to police departments begins the process of turning ordinary police agencies into Praetorian guards to solidify the power of the now captured state. And finally, in that category, exempting police uni unions from crackdowns on other government employee union activities, like Scott Walker did in Wisconsin, speeds up the process of ensuring the loyalty of the one legally armed, duty-sworn agency of government, the police. The next, ignore competence and incompetence. Only loyalty matters. You know, people, even mainstream Republicans, I mean, you see, you see, you know, George Will on TV going, you know, Ben Carson running a major agency? Really? Uh, you know, Betsy DeVos running a major agency? Wilbur Ross running a major agency? These people are not competent. And then you've got the guys like Ryan Zinke, Scott Pruitt, and Mick Mulvaney, who seem to be anti-competent. They're very good at getting things done, but what they're getting done is destroying the agencies that they're supposed to be running. How can this be? Well, really what this is all about is shifting the power in America away from government protections for consumers, workers, and voters, and citizens, and toward giving such power to the billionaire and corporate class. And the key to the whole thing is loyalty. In 2016, Trump introduced a raised arm loyalty oath in his campaign rallies in 2016. And Glenn Beck said on ABC television, quote, we all look at Adolf Hitler in 1940. We should begin to look at Hitler in 1929. Donald Trump is a dangerous man with the things he's been saying. That was Glenn Beck. Trump's obsessive need for loyalty, the result of a lifetime of insecurity and unethical illegal business practices are spreading through government institutions like the EPA and the Department of Defense, the way a fungus spreads through a bag of apples on a warm day. And then we see all these kiss-up, kick-down people, you know, from his uh, doctor to Ryan Zinke and the flag that Zinke requires be in flying over, the, uh, over, the, uh, over his office. Next, foster a sense of helplessness among the opposition. Whether it's done with selective and brutal enforcement of the law, subtly shutting down access to the media, or outright infiltration, destroying the opposition is a key to seizing and holding authoritarian power. When I was a, when I was a teenager, it was, you know, Richard Nixon. And, you know, our, our local Students for a Democratic Society, SDS chapter in, in East Lansing, had been inf infiltrated uh, by both the Michigan State Police and the FBI. And the guy who was always yelling, kill the pigs and burn down the ROTC building, he was one of the guys from the Michigan State Police Department. But it wasn't just the infiltration. We all knew that this guy was, was a cop, right? Or we all guessed it. But what happens is that the presence of the infiltrator disheartens everybody else, causes people not, want, not to want to join the organization. And of course, at that time, I mean, this was 1968, JFK was murdered, MLK was murdered, RFK was murdered. The Panthers were being taken down and other nonviolent groups. What that does is it disheartens the opposition. And then you look at, you know, the, the insane, you know, 10 years in federal prison that over 200 people who were arrested during the Trump inauguration were all facing under a conspiracy to riot charge. 10-year felonies for going out in the streets and protesting Trump. This is, this is how they do it in Turkey. Right? This is how they do it in these, in these authoritarian countries. Fear and a sense of powerlessness or re resignation are two of an authoritarian regime's most powerful weapons. The next is, de is uh, def defeating neo-fascism, neo-authoritarianism, incorporate billionaire corruption. Well, this is, this is the good news. Right? This, is, this is where we get to the good news. I'm going to wrap up with this. There was an amazing study published by uh, Maria Stefan who's the Director of Educational Initiatives at the International Center on Nonviolent Con Conflict, and Erica Chenoweth, uh, Assistant Professor of Government at Wesleyan University and a postdoc at Harvard. It's called Why Civil Resistance Works. It was published in 2008. 
And, you know, I've talked before about Thorsten Veblen, you know, and the, this whole concept from about 100 years ago that there's this influencer class that's about 20% of the population, and if you can convince 20% of the population of something, then that, then they become the ones who influence the rest of the population and it spreads through the population. Well, there may be some truth to that, but, you know, we've all been working on this 20% model for literally my entire lifetime. Turns out the percentage of people that you need to not just convince, but actually get to engage in action that is visible is 3.5%. If you can get 3.5% of the people to show up, to physically show up, you can flip an entire country. And this is how the Koch brothers and their buddies flipped the, the Republican Party. They got 3.5% of Americans. That's, that's, a little, that's about 1.1 million people. Right? They got, you know, well, we've got 300 million people, roughly, in the United States. 3% um, of that, no, that would be 9 million people, wouldn't it? Yeah, around 10 million people, I guess. Be 3%. 10 million, yeah, 10 million people. So, oh, geez, I've got to, I've got to correct my article then. So if we, if we can get 10 million people active, then things change. If only 3.5% of the population engaged in peaceful, nonviolent, persistent protest.